Professor Martin Lindgren for the very nice introduction. And it is my truly honor here to be to present my work here and to the audience as an award lecture. So my title today is um, some a collection of my recent work. And I called my research group the junction of statistics and biology, which is represented by three colors in the logo with statistics in blue biology in green and purple standing for the junction. So I want to say that the combination or the junction of the two fields is not a simple combination, but is a synergy. So along with the, the three colors, I would refer to anything that's related to statistics or statistical rigor by the blue color, anything related to biology or genomics by the green color, and anything of our proposal by the purple color. So I want to open my talk by drawing this connection to Lyon. So Claude Bernard is a famous uh, physician, and he's regarded as one of the greatest French scientists over time. And the connection here is that um, Claude proposed the use of experimental medicine, which means that association doesn't imply causation. So he said that using negative control is a must, as we have been doing in um, double-blinded cl clinical trials nowadays. And the connection here is that in Lyon, there's a university named after him. So in biological experiments, negative control is a must. Just as we can see from this simple cartoon, if we want to evaluate the effect of water on plant growth, we will plant the same number of seeds in the treatment group and the control group, but we only give water to the treatment group, the no water in the control group. Then we compare the outcome. So this will allow us to assess whether water does play a role. And you can see in this case, the negative control group is a concrete thing. Um, but in genomic data analysis, what is the negative control is not often so obvious or concrete. So this cartoon shows a common analysis RNA sequencing differential expression analysis in which we have three replicates under each condition and every column here represents a gene. So when we do differential expression analysis, the goal is to compare every gene's values, expression values under the two conditions to see if there's a difference. So our intuition would say that the left one, left gene has a difference, the right gene may not have a difference. But what is the negative control here? That's the question. And if we think about it, it's actually embedded in the null hypothesis in the statistical test we will do here. So essentially, we will do one hypothesis test per gene. And if we reject the null hypothesis that the gene has no expression difference between the two conditions, we would call the gene a DE gene. But as you can see, the null hypothesis is not as concrete or as obvious as we have from the medicine or biological experiments. There is a definition of a null hypothesis. It is a type of conjecture used in statistics that proposes that there's no difference between certain characteristics of a population or data generating process. As you can see, it's called a conjecture, which implies that it's quite abstract. So since it's abstract, there is often a gap between method developers who propose those statistics heavy methods and method users who use those methods for data analysis, but are not really clear about what's inside. So therefore the null hypothesis concept is often misunderstood and misused. So in my talk, I will address the following questions. First, what is an appropriate null hypothesis? I will show an example that different null hypotheses may lead to different discoveries and conclusions. Second question is, how to make an abstract null hypothesis concrete? For this, I will propose the, the idea of using synthetic null data. Third, how to use synthetic null data to reduce false discoveries. For this, I will propose a contrastive strategy so question one, what is an appropriate null hypothesis? Let's come back to the spoke RNA-seq differential expression analysis. So the question is to identify the genes that are differentially expressed, and we do one hypothesis test per gene. For this test, the two most popular methods, which were developed for small sample sizes, that means for each condition, the number of replicates is small, sometimes only three. 
The two popular methods are HR and DEC. They have been the state of the art tools in the field. And actually they share a common assumption, which is they assume that every gene, let's say here we have, um, so look at one gene only. For a given gene, it follows a negative binomial distribution under each condition. So for this gene, we can refer to its n values in condition one by x1 to xn, its n values in condition two as y1 to ym. So under each condition, the values are assumed to be independent, independently following a negative binomial distribution. And this distribution has two parameters, a mean parameter and the dispersion parameter related to the variance. So for the mean parameter, the assumption is that for the values in condition one, they share the same mu one parameter as the condition mean, but to allow for the sample heterogeneity or the library size difference, they have the sample specific size factor as SI for sample I in condition one and SJ for sample J in condition two. So under this model, the null hypothesis is that mu one equals to mu two. So even though the two methods have some technical differences besides this model, but the core part both assume the negative binomial distribution. So we can see that this null hypothesis is only appropriate if the negative binomial assumption is reasonable. So in our analysis, in the collaboration project with Dr. Wei Li's lab at UC Irvine, we found this result by coincidence. That is, there is a large sample size data, patient data from the cell paper, which studied 51 patients pre-treatment and 58 patients on treatment in an immunotherapy study. So running DEC2 and HR on this data set to compare these two groups of patients, so every patient has a bulk RNA-seq data, we actually got the number of D genes marked by the red dots here. So you can see that the number differ quite a bit, and actually the overlap is not so big. So to really understand why, we had this idea of randomly permuting the group label between the two groups. So we still assign 51 people into one group and the remaining 58 people in the other group, but the labels are shuffled. So on these data, we run the two methods and the bar here shows the average number of DE genes found by each method across the permutation, permuted data sets. And the bar here, so this one shows us one standard deviation. So the result is very surprising because we don't expect that many genes would be identified as DE genes from permuted data. Then what's the reason? The reason is that on these patient data, the negative binomial or MB assumption does not hold well. So here I'm showing one gene's expression levels in the two groups. And here is a quantile, quantile, or QQ plot. Try to compare two distributions. So the x-axis shows the theoretical quantile of the cumulative distribution function, or CDF values, assuming that the fitted negative binomial distribution by HR is accurate. If so, then the theoretical quantile should be uniform between zero to one. And the y-axis shows the empirical quantiles after we transform each value using the HR fitted negative binomial into a CDF value. So we can see that in the ideal case, the dots should lie on the diagonal line, but we don't actually have this. There are a few outliers. This is for one group. For the second group, this phenomenon is more severe, the violation of the assumption. And for the seq 2 fitted negative binomial, this is another gene, we see a more severe violation of the model assumption, the negative binomial distribution. If we look at other genes collectively, the left group shows that the genes that are rarely identified from permitted data, which means they are quite good, and the right group shows the genes that are often identified from permit data, which means they are problematic. So for the good group versus the problematic group, we check the goodness of fit of the negative binomial assumption. And here is showing the negative log of the goodness of fit p-value. So the smaller the p-value, which means the greater the y-value here, indicates poorer fitting. 
So we can see that as we expected for the genes that are problematic, the negative binomial fits more poorly than the good group. And I have to give credit to this undergraduate student, Chen Xinjiang, who is from Chinese University of Hong Kong, who wrote me an email and she corrected how we computed the goodness of fit p-value in our original paper. So this is the correction version, corrected version. So the p-value scale is now more reasonable, but the qualitative conclusion still stands. There is a big difference between these two groups of genes, and she will join my group this fall. <laughs> okay, so... And in our result, we also compare with two other popular methods, lemma view, which is a popular method that applies a Gaussian assumption to log transform data, and NOIC, which is a non-parametric method used in the GTAC consortium. So basically, basically GTAC used two methods, DEC2 as a parametric test, and NOIC as a non-parametric method. And we also compared against the classical Wilcoxon rank sum test because here our sample size is 51 and 58, so we are, we are allowed to use Wilcoxon to see the result. But surprisingly, Wilcoxon doesn't identify any D genes from the, the real data, nor does it identify any D genes from permitted data. So at least it's self-consistent. Then we can see why is that. The underlying reason is that it has a different null hypothesis. So assuming that I can normalize my gene expression values within each condition, so I call them x1 tilde to xn tilde and, and y1 tilde to ym tilde. So they are comparable. So I remove the size factor. For example, this can be done using edge r. And then the null hypothesis of Wilcoxon ransom test is this. If we randomly pick one value from condition one and one value from condition two, then which value is bigger is purely random. So therefore, it means that I cannot tell the two sets of values apart by ranking. So this is a much general null hypothesis because it doesn't assume the values follow a certain distribution, not negative binomial assumption. So that explains why the two methods have differences. And if you want to see more data sets, real data comparison, and you can check our paper. And also after our paper was published, there were a lot of discussions on Twitter. If you are interested, you can also check it out. But it, it is a question people are very interested in because bulk RNA-seq differential expression analysis is so commonly used. And I can say that in the old days, when we only have three and three experimental replicates per condition, a negative binomial assumption seemed to be something we must assume. Otherwise, we wouldn't have statistical power. In that case, Wilcoxon wouldn't give us discoveries. And also, with three values only, there's no way to check whether negative binomial is a reasonable assumption or not. It's something we have to believe in. But with the patient data, right, first, they are not replicates. Second, you have much larger sample size. Then we don't have to stick with the data we use for small sample size data. That's one message. And the second message is that if we think about this problem more deeply, which null hypothesis is more appropriate? Because we have told you that here the negative binomial is used in D62 and HR, while Will Coxon doesn't use that null hypothesis. To answer this question, it seems to be a little abstract. But our intuition, why we think in that paper that, oh, having many D genes from permuted data seems to be a problem is because we have this intuition. That is, after we randomly label our data, there shouldn't be DE genes. Why is that? What does permutation actually provide us? It's actually synthetic null. We are generating synthetic null or in silico negative control from real data by assuming that after permutation, there shouldn't be any DE signals we are looking for. So then, this gives me the second question. Given the null hypothesis is often abstract, can we make it more concrete? So synthetic null is a way to make a null hypothesis that's just in our mind, a conjecture, into some real or I would say concrete data set we can work on. So I will show another example where permutation can help. So this example is about this TSNE UMAP embedding interpretation. There have been a lot of discussion about how we can trust TSNE UMAP 
plots, which are so commonly used in single cell data. You can see it in almost every single cell paper. So there is a famous blog that shows that, that says how to use TSNI effectively. It has several messages. I'm just putting two here. The first one is that hyperparameters really matter. TSNI has one key hyperparameter called perplexity. So this is a simulation example in which the original dimension is two, and there are two clouds. But if you vary the perplexity parameter from two to 100, you can see that sometimes the points are not so well separated. Sometimes they're very well separated. Sometimes they're mixed. So you will see different patterns giving you different conclusions. And another message in this blog is that distances between clusters might not mean anything. Because you can see here, they are, there's almost no distance in the TSNI embedding space, but here the distance is big. So the question we have here is that, can we find a way to tell if a cell's embedding is dubious or trustworthy? So our idea is to examine the cell's neighbors before and after the embedding. So to be exact, before embedding, typically in an analysis pipeline such as SURAT, the before embedding space is the PC space, 20 to 50 PCs of cells after log transformation and normalization. So then we entered those 20 to 50 dimensions into TSNI and your UMAP to get a two-dimensional embedding space. That's how it works. So our idea is that if we want to see whether a cell's embedding is dubious or trustworthy, it should be relative to the cell's neighbors, because most of the time, our conclusions drawn from TSNI or UMAP plots are about the neighboring or distance information. So this work on BioArchive is joint work with Professor Lucy Xia at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and my student Christy, who is also here, and she will give a talk in the BioVis COSI around noon today. So she will give a talk about this method more specifically. And the method is called SED. The intuition of SED is that how can we say a cell is trustworthy? So this is a cartoon illustration of a cell we think as trustworthy, which means that the cell's neighbors before embedding and the after embedding, we have two sets of neighbors. And looking at the neighbors distances to the cell in the 2D embedding space, we can actually have two distance vectors. So in the vector, every element is an ordered neighbor. So from the uh, closest to the farthest in the 2D space. So I'm getting this vector for the after embedding neighbors and one for the pre embedding neighbors. And both vectors were computed by Euclidean distances in the 2D embedding space. The reason we think this is a useful comparison is because we are looking at the 2D embedding space and our mind is very sensitive to Euclidean spaces when we look at this figure. So intuitively, if the cells ranked or older neighbors are very consistent before embedding and after embedding, then these two vectors will be very similar. And therefore, if we compute a Pearson correlation between the two vectors, the Pearson correlation will be high. And we call this a reliability score. The reason we use Pearson correlation because we think the magnitude of the distances matter, not just the rank. So we use Pearson correlation instead of a rank correlation. In contrast, if a cell has a dubious embedding, what we have in mind is that the cell's neighbors change dramatically after embedding. So the pre-embedding neighbors may be very different from the post-embedding neighbors. So therefore, the two vectors will be very different, and the Pearson correlation, what we call the reliability score, will be low. But how high is high? How low is low? To answer this question, we need a reference or null hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? Here, what we think as a reasonable null is that a cell's neighbors are randomly selected after embedding. So to achieve this, we randomly permuted every gene across the cells. So after that, you can see all the cells become equivalent and the cell-cell distances become random. So any cell can be a neighbor of any other cell because the relationship is no longer biological. It's purely due to randomness. So with the permuted data for each cell, we still apply the same procedure to get a reliability score. As I said, 
the procedure permutation makes all sales equivalent and exchangeable, then all the sales reliability scores pulled together will give me a null distribution. And this null distribution just tell me what magnitude would I expect my reliability score to be if the neighbor, if the neighbors were randomly assigned after embedding. So based on this null distribution, we can be conservative and only call the values which are below this left tail threshold, say 5% quantile. If we call these values as dubious, then we can tell, oh, by comparing real sales reliability, reliability scores to this quantile, this threshold, we can find dubious sales. And we can call the upper tail as trustworthy sales. So all these decisions were based on this null distribution. So then let me show you one result about how SAD works. So this is a single cell rna seq data set, the first single cell rna seq data set of Hydra, a freshwater species. And this is from the 2019 science paper. So this is the original embedding in the paper. Running as it did on this embedding, we can actually find dubious cells in those small clusters, which we think is interesting because people may interpret those small clusters by assigning labels, as in the original studies. But now we know that they're dubious, then maybe their position should be reassigned and the labels could be different. So we can also use as it did if we run it with a grid of perplexity values for TSNE. Then we can pick the perplexity value so that SED has the smallest or leads to the smallest number of dubious embeddings to mi minimize the number of dubious embeddings. And this is the perplexity value we found, 230, which is very different from the original 40. This is like a default setting in CIRAT back then. So a, a very striking result here is that looking at these three small clusters, the two blue ones and the one purple one here, so they became they became merged as one big cluster after we optimized the perplexity. And they are farther away from this orange cluster than in the original study. So the, the orange one is epithelial cells, and the two other, the three other clusters are neuron cells. So this Optimized embedding result is more consistent with the heat map of gene expression data, which shows that indeed the three clusters are not so different and they are much more different from the orange cluster. So this is just one example showing what SED can help us optimize the TSNE embedding. In our preprint, we have more results about UMAP embedding. So I just told you two examples where permutation can give us some null data for us to work on. But in many other examples, especially single cell RNA-seq data analysis, we may need synthetic null generation beyond permutation. And here I'm going to give you a third example, which is about post-clustering differential expression analysis. So this is a figure from this genome biology paper and actually give a very nice illustration about how single cell RNA-seq analysis works. So we have reads in FASTQ file going through mapping and quality control. So we have a gene by cell count matrix. From this matrix, a typical step is to do cell clustering to identify potential cell types and then to understand what each cluster means, people will do differential expression between the clusters so that we will use the genes that are specifically highly expressed in each cluster to annotate the cluster as a potential cell type. And also as a result, the DE genes will be considered as potential cell type markers. So this is what the cell type annotation actually means. So you can see that post-clustering DE are two steps applied to the same data. And this issue is known to statisticians as double dipping. It means that the same data is used twice. And specific in this case, clustering uses gene expression to define cell clusters as potential cell types. DE tests if every gene has the same mean expression between cell clusters. If so, the gene may be used as a marker gene for each cell type. But you can see that a double dipping result could be if the two clusters are spurious, which means that they're not so well separated, even though the clustering algorithm separates them. In the tall example here, two genes are 
giving us this homogeneous cluster. And if we run an algorithm, we can divide the cells into two clusters based on the two genes joint variation. And because the gene expression drive the cluster, clusters, then no wonder both genes will become differentially expressed between the two clusters. So this result told us that the cluster results, um, the clustering result quality cannot be post hoc reflected by DE genes. Because if you trust the result, you may still use the two genes to interpret the two clusters. But from the beginning, the two clusters are not so trustworthy. So as a result, I want to say that I want to give a formal statement here to say that this double dipping would conceptually lead to inflated false discoveries if our goal is to find potential cell type markers. So there are two different null hypotheses. I'll talk about the ideal one we are looking for first. So let me refer to the M genes expression levels in a particular cell as Y1 to YM. And for this particular cell, it has a latent cell type. And for simplicity, I just use binary to consider two cell types at a time. So Z is the latent variable taking binary values 0, 1. We don't observe this because we don't know the true cell type label. What clustering gives us is the cell cluster label. Based on Y1 to YM, we can get a Z hat, which is also binary if we force ourselves to get two clusters. Then the ideal null hypothesis is that conditioning on the true cell type Z being 0, 1, the gene J has the same expectation, same conditional expectations. So this is how we should define gene J as a non-marker gene or true non-DE genes if we have the cell type labels, but we don't. So the double dipping post-clustering and DE null hypothesis is this. I call this H0DD. So the conditions are changed from Z to Z hat. So we're conditioning on the cluster label Z hat to compare gene J's two means. So you can imagine that when this H0DD does not hold, but H0 holds, then you would for sure have a false positive cell type marker gene because H0DD should be rejected, but H0 should not be rejected, right? So therefore you have this discrepancy. So then to address this double dipping issue, realizing that it's something we cannot avoid in single cell data analysis, right? We don't have a good alternative to say we don't do this, even though in the literature, there are methods called cluster-free DE methods. You skip the clustering step, you do the DE directly. But I'm afraid that this cell-free or cluster-free DE method doesn't approach the same problem because skipping the clustering step, you lose the opportunity to, um, to find potential cell types. You just look at genes directly. So I'm, not, I'm saying that it's not the same problem. If we still are doing cell type annotation, then it seems to me that clustering followed by DE is an approach we cannot avoid, the double dipping approach. Then our idea is that not to avoid double dipping, but can we provide a negative control from the beginning so we can counteract any possible inflation caused by double dipping? And this idea is actually motivated by the use of negative control samples in biological experiments from the beginning. So no matter, no matter how complicated the experimental procedure is, we can compare the results in the end. That's the idea. Then what is the meaningful negative control for cell type discovery? What we have in mind is that all cells are in one hypothetical cell type, which means that clustering shouldn't give us meaningful clusters. And the reason we think this is a reasonable null hypothesis is, is because this null hypothesis is giving us this conclusion that all genes satisfy the ideal null hypothesis. So this will make all genes true non-DE under the ideal null hypothesis, not under the post-clustering double dipping null hypothesis. So we need a way to have this model, right? Can we have a model for our data under this one cell type null hypothesis? And even we have this model, the model itself will be abstract 
how can us how can we analyze data under the snow model so here the synthetic null generation idea will help us so if we have a null model and we have a way to generate synthetic null data from the model then we can analyze synthetic null data in parallel to real data so for this our work SC Design 2 and the latest version SC Design 3 can help us with the data generation. So I want to say that for this one cell type specific scenario, SC Design 3 is equivalent to SC Design 2, even though as a newer version, SC Design 3 has more functionalities, which I'll briefly mention very soon. So these two works were led by my student Tian Yi and Dong Yuan. So I will talk about SC Design 3 on behalf of Dong Yuan, who cannot come due to visa issue at 5.20 um, p.m. today in this Rexis COSI. So first of all, let me show you that what SC Design 3 can do. So to generate synthetic null data, so here the real data has two cell clusters that are not so well separated. What we have in mind is that the synthetic cell should be in one big cluster that look like the union of the real cells. And what SCD9-3 model can preserve is the gene mean statistics. So we are actually comparing the real data, target data to synthetic null data for every gene. Every dot is one gene, and we're plotting the gene mean values. And here we're plotting the gene variances values. So SCD9-3 can preserve per gene mean and variance pretty well as well as gene-gene correlations. So this is the correlation matrix from target real data. This is the correlation matrix from synthetic null data. So the gene-gene correlations SCD3 preserves is the correlation across all the real cells. You may wonder why don't I use permutation in this case? Because I have given you two examples where I use permutation. So this is showing the permutation data. When we permute each gene independently across all cells, we can preserve gene mean and gene variance as expected, but the gene-gene correlation is gone. Missing this piece of information will make this permitted data not as a good negative control as our SC Design 3 data. The reason is a clustering algorithm will take all genes expression information into account. So gene-gene correlation will play a big role in driving the clusters. If we want to make sure the clusters we get from synthetic null data are comparable to the clusters we got from the real data, then preserving gene-gene correlations is important. Another method, some of the people who know statistics might have heard of is called the knockoff method, which was proposed by Barbara and Candace in 2015. So knockoff was proposed as a way to generate negative control in a high dimensional multivariate uh, supervised learning scenario. So the idea is to disrupt any conditional associations between one predictor or feature or covariate with the Y, with the outcome, condition on other features. So it's a way to generate negative control, even though we don't have a supervised learning setting here. But to see whether it might fit our purpose, we can use the real data to clusters as the Y, as a label in knockoff, and using the logistic regression setting to generate the corresponding design matrix, the X matrix, as the knockoff data. But you can see that even though knockoff, as it should be, preserves gene-gene correlations very well, but it actually distorted the gene mean and gene variance. The reason we think is because it's not designed for single cell data per se. So besides the example I just showed you, when the two cell types in real data have a bigger gap in their uh, UMAP embedding space, which means that they're better separated, we can still generate synthetic null data to fill in the gap but still preserve the, the overall topology of the real cells. And again, gene mean variance, gene gene correlations are pretty well preserved. So now I'm going to talk about how SC Design 3 does exactly for synthetic null generation. So for simplicity, we're just plotting two genes for illustration. So here the cells, the dots here are the real cells. So to generate cells, synthetic cells from one cluster or one type, we are using our previous knowledge that for single cell RNA-seq data measure with the unique molecular identifiers, UMIs, such as in the 10x genomics technologies or drop seq technologies, for each gene, if, it's, if the cells are in one type, a homogeneous type, like a cell line or well-annotated blood cell type, then the genes count distribution should follow negative binomial pretty well. So we have plenty of evidence showing that. 
motivated by this, then taken, taking every genes counts marginally across all the cells, we fit a negative binomial distribution to assume that there's only one type. I want to make a note that it's possible the real counts do not follow negative binomial well if it's from two cell types, so there will be a bimodal distribution. But what we are doing here is to force ourselves to fit a negative binomial distribution as well as possible, so we can generate a hypothetical synthetic null data to represent one cell type. And this idea is very similar to what people do in likelihood ratio tests. You have two no you have two hypotheses, no alternative. You fit likelihood under each hypothesis. So what we're doing here is to fit a model under the null hypothesis. That's the marginal count modeling. And the tricky part is the bottom, the joint gene called joint gene modeling. For this, we use a technique from multivariate statistics called Gaussian copula. Although the name is a jargon, but what it actually means is as follows. Distributional transform. So we first transform every gene's count values into the cumulative distribution function, CDF values, based on its empirical distribution. And this one could be, and this one should give us values between zero and one. With those CDF values, then we transform them into Gaussian values, standard Gaussian N01 values, to, so that every gene's values is now in the standard Gaussian scale. And with this, this is the key part. We fit a multivariate Gaussian distribution for all genes transform values jointly. The idea here to use the multivariate Gaussian for the joint structure is because it will give us a homogeneous distribution with more cells in the center and fewer cells unscattered. So this is a common, or maybe I should say most common copula for getting joint modeling. So with this multivariate Gaussian fitted, then the remaining is sampling, synthetic null generation. We first independently draw N samples, like N synthetic cells from this multivariate Gaussian. So every gene's values in the synthetic cells will be in the standard Gaussian scale. Then we use the standard Gaussian CDF to turn the values into CDF values between zero and one. Finally, we use here the marginal, marginally fitted negative binomial distributions to reversely or inversely transform the CDF values into the counts, which are the scales of the negative binomials. So finally, the counts will be our synthetic counts for synthetic cells. So you can see that this generation process will give us synthetic cells that do not have one-to-one -one maps with real cells because they were independently sampled from the null model we fit it. But the genes are one-to-one -one match because every gene is considered to be a variable or feature in our modeling. So one question I often got asked by people who are really familiar with the deep learning literature for simulator is that why not use deep learning like that again to generate synthetic data? The first answer I would give is that because here the synthetic null data is not just trying to mimic real data, we also try to modify real data so the synthetic cells are from one homogeneous cell type. If I use GAN, I'm not sure how we can generate synthetic null data by modifying its parameters. It's not, it's not clear to me. And the second answer is that in our SAD Design 3 paper, we actually showed this example in which we can generate synthetic cells along a cell trajectory. So this is the real data. This is the synthetic data by SAD Design 3. This is the synthetic data by SEGM. So looking at this value, MLISI, which measures the similarity between this set of cells and this set of real cells. So the values change between one and two, with two being the optimum, the maximum. So we can see that looking at the similarity, we are doing better than SEGAN. And also we are much faster than SEGAN. So for these reasons, we think our model is a very good um, tool for simulating single cell data. So finally, my question is, how can we use synthetic null data to reduce false discoveries? For this part, I want to propose the use of contrastive strategy. And here it is. So back to this post clustering DE analysis problem. Suppose that I use SCD3 to generate synthetic null data, then I have a contrast, right? Parallel analysis. And I can run 
clustering and DE analysis on each data set in parallel. For example, this can be done by the default SURAP pipeline or any pipeline of user's choice. So what we get after the two steps is that every gene will get a DE score. So for example, the DE score could be defined as the negative log p-value from the analysis on target data. Like you have two clusters, you run a DE for analysis for every gene, you get a p-value for that gene, you do the negative log transformation to get a DE score. The intuition is that the larger the DE score, the more likely the gene is a DE gene. And we do the same thing on the synthetic null data to get no DE scores. So for the M genes, we get M target D scores, M null D scores. That gives us a way to do the comparison. So the last step to do the contrast, how do we do? So we will use a method we previously published called Clipper to do the contrast. That means for every gene I, we look at SI and SI tilde, target score and null score to do a contrast based on which we will find a threshold on the contrast scores to call DE genes. So together, this method is called cluster DE, led by my student Dong Yuan and Ke Xin, which the bioarchive version should be online very soon. So what is Clipper? It is a contrastive strategy for p-value free FDR control. You may wonder why would I need to do p-value free FDR control, false discovery for FDR. The reason is because to get a p-value, you need to have many, many null values to give you a distribution. Then you compare your target score to the null distribution to get a p-value. That's what we did for SED. But in this case, it will be very computationally intensive to generate many, many synthetic null data to get a distribution. We can ge generate synthetic null just for once and then do the contrast. This is like in an experiment, you don't have many, many negative control samples. You may only have one negative control, but you still hope the contrast will give you more reliable result. That's the same intuition. So this is the Clipper paper. It has more technical details inside, but at a high level, I want to say what Clipper can do is that it allows the control of false discovery rate, FDR, by removing the need for high resolution p-values, which are needed for traditional statistical analysis, like a benjamin hochberg procedure or the Q-value procedure. Both will require high resolution p-values. Getting rid of this requirement will leave us a lot of flexibility by not making parametric assumptions like negative binomial or not requiring large sample sizes so we can do well coxum. And the foundation goes to the knockoff paper, which I briefly mentioned before. Even though knockoff is trying to generate knockoff data in the supervised learning setting, but they have a theory which we can adopt here for controlling the FDR without using high resolution p-values. So specifically, what Clipper does is that it will con construct a contrast score for every feature. We have a total of M features. And the assumption Clipper requires is that the contrast scores for the majority of features that are not interesting, which means that they're from the null hypothesis, their contrast scores should be symmetric about zero. So which, which side, like if you have target null, which value is bigger will be random. So this symmetry is like the uniform assumption for p-values under the null, if we use p-values. With the symmetry satisfied and some other technical conditions, then the contrast score cutoff is this blue line drawn here. The idea is to use the symmetry to call the blue tail as discoveries, the red tail as false discoveries by symmetry. Then red tail over blue tail will be an estimate for FDR. So our idea is to control this ratio under a target threshold, say 5% for FDR control, such that we can have the ratio satisfy this FDR threshold 5%, and we minimize the T as much as possible to move it to as left as possible so the discovery is maximized. That's the idea of Clipper. So, but I want to say that you may think this is so magical, right? How can I get rid of p-values while controlling the FDR? Here, the trick lies in that it requires the number of features to be large. So it must be a high dimensional multiple testing problem so that the features themselves serve as a reference so we can have the symmetry to guide our thresholding. 
So specifically, the contrast score is, can be defined as a difference, or there are other ways, but difference is the simplest way to define it. So we can apply a procedure. It could be a complex pipeline to target data and synthetic null data simultaneously, and getting the scores, like the D score for gene J, this is a target D score, this is a null D score, we take the difference. And we believe that this one or this one is bigger is depending on randomness if the gene J is not a true D gene. That's the intuition. So that will give us a contrast score. So just as a reminder, the synthetic null is generated by SCD3. So this is the whole cluster DE method. So Clipper fill, fills in the last bit. We have the two sets of these scores. We get contrast scores, one per gene. We find the threshold on contrast scores. And for the genes whose contrast scores are greater than the threshold will be found as DE genes by cluster DE. So I'll quickly go over some real data results. So there are five cell lines from which we shouldn't expect to find any cell type marker genes because there are no cell types within. And as we expected, cluster DE coupled with five DE tests in the SURA package, Wilcoxon t-test, negative binomial likelihood ratio, and by mode. So across the five, cluster DE found zero DE genes for most of the cell line and test combinations. While using the default SURAT, we have thousands of DE genes, sometimes even close to 99% of all genes. And count split T and test, which I didn't review in detail, they are two existing methods that were proposed to counteract this double dipping issue. However, on this data set, we can see that they still find thousands of genes. And the underlying reason is that for both methods, their validity check in their papers were under the assumption that genes are independent. But on real data, genes are not independent. That's the primary reason. And in the positive case, where there are two monocyte cell subtypes, we can see that cluster DE can find some DE genes, even though much fewer than the other methods. But here we would recommend using cluster DE with Wilcoxon because all our tests show that Wilcoxon gives the most stable result in terms of FDR control and cell type marker gene discovery. So from now on, I'll focus on this data set. So these are four biological replicates of PBMC, and we focus on these two monocytes. So first thing I want to say is that we should expect that cluster DE can discover cell type markers that are known. And housekeeping genes, which are expected to express everywhere, should not be identified as marker genes in the top DE list. So this is what we see in cluster DE. This is a marker gene, CD16. This is a housekeeping gene. We can see that their ranks differ a lot in the cluster DE result, but they were ranked similarly by Surat in the default setting. And also looking at the top five genes found by cluster DE or Surat, we can also see that the top genes in cluster DE the, each of them exhibited very distinct distributions between two clusters, but that's not the case for SURAT. The distributions are very hardly distinguishable. Finally, the gene set enrichment analysis shows that cluster DE can rank the known markers uh, in the top of, of its DE gene list, while the housekeeping genes are ranked in the bottom, middle to bottom, while in SURAT, both sets of genes were ranked close to the top. So they are not so well distinguished in the GSEA analysis. And so the reason why cluster DE can, cannot or does not identify housekeeping genes as its top DE genes is because of the use of contrast scores, which is the difference between target D score and no D score. So we can see that for the housekeeping genes in blue, their target D gene scores are high. So that's why Sura will find them. But their no D scores are also high. So that's why by contrast, um, cluster DE will remove them. So cluster D uses the y-axis, so we can distinguish the red genes, the marker genes, from the blue genes, which are the housekeeping genes. And finally, I want to say that this contrastive strategy is a computationally efficient alternative to p-value strategy. So this is another work we showed that in the eQTL analysis, using Clipper, we can get almost identical result as the state-of-the-art fast QTL method, but reducing the computational time by a hundredfold. 
So to summarize my talk, I talk about three questions. What is an appropriate null hypothesis? And I showed in this bulk DE analysis that under under MB assumption or the rank equivalence assumption of Wilcoxon, we may get different results. And permutation gives us a synthetic null here. In the second example, second question, how to make abstract null hypothesis concrete, I talk about the use of synthetic null data and permutation used again can give us the SED method for detecting dubious TSNE UMAP embeddings. Finally, in the most complicated example three, the post-crusting DE analysis, I propose to use SEDLAN3 for synthetic null generation. For the last question, what do we do with synthetic null? I propose this contrastive strategy using Clipper, which can be applied to QTL. And finally, putting pieces together, our method cluster DE combines the synthetic null generation upstream of SURAT and using Clipper as a contrastive strategy downstream of SURAT. So I want to give two take home messages to the community. The first one is synthetic null data can make an abstract null hypothesis concrete and enable contrastive data analysis. One thing I want to emphasize is that the synthetic null data generation is real data specific and problem specific. That will give users more flexibility to explore what's the real null hypothesis I use in my analysis instead of just using a method as a black box. So this is a quote from a Chinese proverb says, teaching someone to fish is better than giving them a fish. That's what I think we should give our method users instead of just letting them use our tools without much understanding. So having the synthetic knowledge as a contrast can give them better understanding of how reliable the results are. The second message or a question is, do we still believe it less is more? First, there is an OCAMS razor, the principal parsimony, which is widely used in many scientific disciplines where we have to do a lot of inference. We don't have many data available. Do we still believe in this given the massive data we have nowadays in our method development? Second, I think fewer but more reliable discoveries can better lead us to real science. But unfortunately, I think the fact is that people may prefer a method that gives you a lot of discoveries so you can pick the results from the discoveries. So I think this is something we should probably educate our method users. So finally, I want to give acknowledgments to many people, starting from my PhD advisors at Berkeley, Peter and Haiyan, and my collaborators, whom I color by the field, biologists in green and statisticians in blue, and my trainees, many trainees, especially Dong Yuan, who have led a major efforts in cluster D and CDN3, and he will be on the job market. I think he will be an outstanding candidate. And my former trainees and my nominators for nominating me for this award. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you all so much. We have a very, very short time for questions. So I'm actually gonna start with one from online. Um, what is the difference between generating single cell data and the other data, for example, bar bulk RNA data? Very good question. I think the generation, if you want to go with the model-based approach we use in SDN3, I think the key is to check the data distribution. You want to propose a distribution or model that can fit your data very well. So the data you simulate can be realistic. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I was wondering, because in generative models of the new hypothesis, there may be a lot of variability in the generation process. So how do you aggregate the different results you can have in terms of FDR control? Uh, that's a very good question. So it's about the data integration problem, or I should say FDR control on integrated data, if I understand it correctly. I think there is no general solution to all the problems because it depends on how your analysis is, is done. Would you like to remove some batch effects first and then work on the integrated data, integrated data or does the model itself consider batch effects? So th these will make the analysis different. But I think, and that's one example where I think synthetic null data may help. So if you can have a way to get some synthetic null data based on your real data, maybe permutation 
simulation or maybe a model-based simulation. So you can trust that the synthetic node data shouldn't, shouldn't contain the signals you're looking for. Then you can feed those synthetic node data into your same analysis pipeline and compare the results. So I want to say that we want to work along this line in more scenarios how, about how synthetic node data can be generated. And one particular application which is important is the integration problem, which is very widely used in single cell data as well. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jessica. Yeah. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I had a question. I really like your SC3, uh, yeah, SC Design 3 <laughs> approach for the, for the gene. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if it's applicable to the first question you asked, because I, I think in a lot of even bulk RNA seq data set, we have a lot of like latent variables. Your permutation approach, I guess, assume at least exchangeability between observations. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on thank that. You, thank you very much. I think that's a very insightful question, David. And I would say that, um, yes, the reason we can independently permute genes in the bulk DE analysis is because the DE analysis examines one gene at a time. It doesn't use genes jointly. And in the post-clustering DE part, the reason we need to keep gene-gene correlation is because the clustering step uses all genes jointly. So correlation is something more crucial. But regarding the marginal DE test, how much does gene-gene correlation play a role here? I think that is a fundamental statistical question because all the FDR control, it doesn't matter to be Benjamin Hochberg or Q-Value or our Clipper, the knockoff-based literature, independence is assumed to be to, to guarantee the FDR control. But how can you make sure the test results, multiple testing results are not so independent? Probably generating the synthetic node to be independent can somehow disrupt the dependency. That's our intuition. But keeping the correlation in our synthetic node data, how well does it perform? We haven't explored that yet, but it could be a very interesting direction. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk. And just coming from a data user perspective, yeah. I was just wondering if you had explored uh, the issue or how much the performance of SC Design 3 or even Cluster D uh, varies with depth. Because one of the issues that I often encounter, at least in neuroscience, is Oh, you have a slide. Actually, yes, <laughs> I, I, I didn't mention it is, it. is the variability on you know how many cell types you're is in single cell data. There's a huge variability on depth, and then you will think that that will affect your power, right? Totally. So you can actually see that these four data sets are biological replicates, but their cell number and sequencing depth are different because this is based on drop seek and these are based on 10x genomics. So that can explain why the default SURAT with a double dipping issue, its number of discovered DE genes can differ so much, right? This is only seven genes and this is more than 1,000 genes. But at least our empirical evidence shows that using cluster D will work with Wilcoxon as the default testing method. Our results are a little bit more stable, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think this also shows that synthetic null can probably capture some of the technical differences so that when you do the contrast, you can better remove the technical differences you're not interested in. 